Hola. ¿Cómo están? Yes. Ok, so, hablo un poquito de español, pero no es bueno. No tengo vocabulario para presentar en entero. Entonces, voy a hablar en inglés, pero despacio. Si necesitas más despacio, ok. I am so happy to be here con ustedes camposeros. So excited. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Becky Stern, and I document things that I'm passionate about online. That's my job. And so I hope that you might will indulge me while I document you guys a little bit. If you'll help me. Waving. Wait, one more. Cuando, uh, ¿Cómo es Campus Party Mexico? Gracias. Ok. So today's media landscape, right? It's a swimming pool. Es una piscina. You can all jump in. There's no more... Back when there were books and you wanted to publish a book, you had to have an editor who had access to a printing press. Or if you wanted to make a film, you needed people who know about film to enable you to publish what you want to publish. Now, with the internet, you can publish anything at any time. How many of you have Snapchat, Instagram, WordPress blogs? Yeah. So it's very easy to publish, but how do you succeed at what you want? I don't think that there's one answer, but today I'm going to share with you some things that I think helped me that might also help you. When you pursue a passion, you, you have to be open-minded about where it can show itself. You might think you're passionate about electronics, but maybe you're actually passionate about interconnecting systems, and you might find them somewhere else. So growing up, I knew that I liked cameras a lot. My dad let me borrow a camera of his. He was a newspaper reporter, and he let me borrow a camera when I was in middle school, 35 millimeter uh, film camera, to take a photography class. And when I was in that photography class, I had some success. I learned quickly that I had some, some skills in this area or some natural ability. But I also learned that it was an art form. It's a form of artistic expression, photography is. And that I obviously had a lot to learn in order to be able to use that medium effectively to communicate. So I was very excited. Not only did I find some field where I had some ability. What are you waving for? More, más despacio? Um, and, um, but I learned that it had a wide, a large area that I did not understand yet. So I had a long road to go in photography. So I took a job as a videographer at a summer camp where I was taking video of the campers and I was publishing small quick time clips to the website and then also made a DVD for the kids to take home at the end of the summer, like a keepsake yearbook. But I didn't really like it there. This was my only friend, right? I clashed with the culture of the staff, and I, but I learned something really important. When you have a job that you don't like, it's easy to find out what you do like or what you do want to be do, what you'd rather be doing, and that's because it, it turns into black and white. The things you enjoy about the job go in one bucket, and the things you'd rather not have again go in another bucket. So I came away from this job uh, no, learning some things about what I liked stylistically and practically about what types of video, what types of photography I wanted to do. And I took those with me to my next thing. My next job, I was in college, my next job was in the computer lab at the university I went to in New York. And mostly I did a lot of sitting around, helping students, 
watching the equipment. But mainly I sat at the desk and I worked on my homework. It was a student job. It's a good job. And this was the first time that I started rigorously documenting my projects. I was so excited to be learning electronics. I went to art school, so when I didn't know what I wanted to do, electronics was just like photography, except 10 years later. A huge field with a lot to learn, and I had some natural ability. So I started to take pictures. First of all, I was afraid I was going to make mistakes, so I took pictures so that I could look back and figure out what those mistakes were. But in part, I was just so enthusiastic, I wanted to share with my parents, with my friends, look at this cool thing I'm doing. And I had a teacher in a class called Making Wireless Toys, who made us publish our work on a blog. And this was in uh, like 2006, when like blogs were just starting. And I was like, a blog? Why would I publish my homework on a blog? Nobody wants to see my homework. I don't want to share my homework. Like, what if it's bad? I don't want just randos to be able to see it. I thought it was really out there. But I begrudgingly complied because it was part of our assignment to publish our homework on the website. Our uh, second project for this class was a plush nightlight. So a toy with a light inside it. And this project I made was very close to my heart. I was very interested in industrial agriculture and how the food that we eat comes to be. And in the US, the industrial agriculture system that preys upon illegal immigrants. And in, instead of improving the safety and education of their workers' policies and they're at the meat packing plant, they irradiate the meat. They put it through a, an x-ray machine, essentially, to get kill the bacteria that could have been avoided through proper training. And these, these issues were really important to me, and the way I meditated on them was by creating artwork. And since I really liked crafts and I really liked electronics, I thought I would explore these ideas with crafts and electronics. So I made these steaks. They have LEDs in them. And although the meat doesn't, like real meat doesn't glow after it's irradiated, it's a social statement, right? I'm confident in saying that publishing this project online set the course for my career. So the documentation for this project, I silk screened the steak. I wired up the LEDs, and so that I wouldn't forget how they were wired, I made a diagram. And I published this on the class website. At the time in college, I was obsessed with this magazine. Who knows this magazine? Yeah? OK, great. Obsessed. Their blog was so good. I would sit there and just refresh the blog, just any new projects. They posted technology projects that use creativity. And I was obsessed. And it, was, it wasn't in my wildest imaginations that I would ever be a part of, of a publication like this. But I thought, maybe I'd try. And I submitted my stake project to their blog tip line. And the next day, they published it on the website. And I, like, I fell down. I was so excited that they published my, my project. And then a couple of other blogs posted it too, because they saw it on that blog. And so it was proliferating around the internet, and it was getting comments. Comments from strangers who were intellectually engaging with my work. Some of them were also trolls, so you get negative comments. But I didn't care, because I was so excited, I said to myself, my project is popular enough to have trolls. It was very exciting. I loved the feeling so much that that, sem that, that semester, I submitted four more projects to the Make blog, and they all got published. Here's a picture of me. So happy that my project, see the Make blog? So happy. I was even more elated when then they asked me to write my project up as an article for the print magazine. So now not only was this publication that I loved sharing my work, but they paid me money to do this. And I was like, Wow, 
wasn't a lot of money, but it was a start. But I was in college and I was about to graduate and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Professional LED steak maker is not a job, right? So I, um, I, I went to grad school instead. But how many of you have been asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And when were you first asked that question? Hold up your fingers, how many years old were you? Cuantos años tienen? Cuando esta pregunta, cinco, tres, diez. Young, right? Young. And you can't answer with 10 things. You're supposed to answer with one thing. I want to be a teacher. I want to be an engineer. Before you had any idea of what those things actually were. And it's so one-sided to think that just one word or one phrase could define who you're going to be when you grow up. And I think that that question is fundamentally flawed. So I, I always had trouble answering this question. When I was three, I wanted to be a mommy because all I knew was my family and my mom was my favorite person. When I went to school, then I wanted to be a teacher because the people I looked up to were all teachers. But then as I learned more and more things I was interested in, the question became harder and harder to answer because I have too many interests. So, or I was told too many. So after college, I went to grad school and I only went to grad school because I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grow up. I didn't, the only skills I felt like I had were in advertising. And we know about advertising, right? It's very creative field, but it can also crush you because you're using your creativity to sell someone else's product. And I, I was very wary that that was going to have a bad effect on my life. So I went to school and as soon as I entered grad school, I had this oh, big sigh of relief. Finally, I can make again and not worry about what I want to be when I grow up. So I was free to do deep dives into topics that I was passionate about. One thing, I already knew some electronics, right? I learned some electronics in college, but I wanted to learn embroidery. And so, but I didn't want to feel like a total beginner the whole time. So I incorporated the embroidery into my electronics or vice versa. And I do, it, I, I do this with lots of things. When I get a new hobby, I dive really deep and I invest a lot of time and energy to learning. And I just, like a sponge, I just love to learn about stuff. And I invest energy, time, and often also money into these hobbies. But at a certain point, I start to get bored. And this, happens, this has happened to me so many times that I, I did embroidery for a long time until it wasn't interesting to me anymore. But then I felt bad. I was like, well, but I've invested all of this time and energy and people think I'm good at it now. I probably shouldn't stop. So I go a little bit longer and then I'm like, I don't know, this other thing is interesting me more. So then I made this. After a few years though, I was, that's, that feeling started to get stress me out again. What if it means that I can't stick to one thing? What if I can't have a normal job because nothing holds my interests for longer than a year or two years at the max? But then I asked myself, what is the culture that's telling me I have to be one thing? Lots of people, I guess our generation not so much, but the older generation, you get a job and you have that job for your whole life. That's not so common now, right? People change jobs, change careers. You're 40 years old, you decide, I don't want to do this, I want to do this entirely different thing. And that's easier than it's ever been. So if you can relate, ask yourself when you learned, when you learned that being one thing was, was what you were supposed to do in life. Follow your one interest to its terminal conclusion. It's easy to see this interest in too many things as a weakness or a limitation. 
because of what culture says about, about doing one thing. But I would encourage you to look at it as a strength because the only way that innovation happens, oh, and I wrote some more articles. The only way that innovation happens is at the intersection of fields. True innovation only happens when you have, if, you have, if you're making a new medical device, you need people who specialize in the technology, you need people who specialize in medicine to work together. And so there's nothing that says you can't innovate with the different people who live inside your head. So because I was publishing a lot of stuff online in grad school, and I felt like a misfit my whole life, I never felt like the people around me understood or uh, had the same interests as me. So I was always seeking friends anywhere I could find them. And the internet is a great place to find friends. Because if you publish, if you're making weird stuff like this, how else am I going to find the friends who are interested in this kind of artwork besides putting it online? So I did that a lot, and I made some new friends. These are my new friends. This is a group called the FAT Lab. And FAT stands for Free Art and Technology. Arte y Tecnología Libre. And FAT's motto is art at the intersection of open source and pop culture. And the only reason they knew about me was because I published stuff online. And the only reason I knew anything about them was because they had a website. There, it's a group of 25 individuals all over the world who publish work together on one website. And we have common goals and interests. If you'll indulge me, I would like to show you a, a video. It's about it's like 14 minutes long, but maybe we won't watch the whole thing if I think that you're getting bored. Also, it might be hard to understand. Can you hear? Is there sound coming out of the... I'll talk writers, over it. Graphic designers, developers. I'll turn the volume down. This, this, um, this is a preview of the documentary film that I am editing about Fat Lab. So in the group, we all have different strengths. My strength is documentation. Um, the group is uh, comprised of graffiti writers and artists and lawyers and people with lots of different interests. And we shared our ideas on a mailing list, an email mailing list. We could throw ideas back and forth and create all kinds of cool projects. This is a, that was a project that enabled a paralyzed man to draw with his eyes. You can't create anything innovative unless it's at the intersection of two or more fields. I firmly believe that. But Fat Lab had this punk attitude. And remember I told you I didn't fit in at that summer camp that I worked at? It was too square. This group is full of like hooligans and sometimes criminals. The, the like peaceful kind of criminals. And we would do things like make a fake Google car and drive it around the streets of Berlin back when like Google Street View was very controversial there about privacy. Just to like see what pe how people would react. And we made a second fake Google car that was like the self-driving car, and we pretended the car was driving itself around New York City. Lots of projects. I won't show you the whole video because you can't understand the audio anyway. Not, not because of like, you can't hear it. So one of the projects is an internet database of graffiti tags, which never would have come to be, like motion detecting algorithms that let you play graffiti with a projector on the side of a building. That's enough. I, you guys get it. Yeah. So 
I was incredibly inspired by these folks. And I was uh, living in a place where I also didn't have many people around. Even though I was in school, my colleagues were computer scientists and mathematicians. And these were my art friends. And they really helped me understand that I needed to drop out of grad school and, not, and surround myself physically with people who were going to uh, be like my friends in the Fat Lab. So I moved back to New York. And I continued to make electronics projects. This time, when I dropped out of grad school, I was offered a full-time job at Make Magazine as their senior video producer. So I was in charge of making all of the how-to videos that the site published good and like effective. A popular project of mine that I made at Make Magazine is this jacket that turns TVs off. So there's a little device. You guys, if you came last year, I think Mitch Altman was here, and he's the inventor of the TV Be Gone. It's an electronics kit that you assemble yourself that acts as a universal remote control for televisions. But it only has one button, power. So when you point it at like a, a whole wall of TVs, it goes through the codes for all of the different manufacturers. Sony, off. Samsung, off. Panasonic, off. Toshiba, I could go on. But I would bring it to restaurants, because I was in, I was living in, um, in Arizona, and it, the culture there, there's just televisions in every restaurant. And I found it distracting, and I would bring this device with me, but the waitresses would see it. I'm like, meh. And they're like, what are you doing? Nothing. So I thought I needed a stealth or a secret way to, to activate the device. And I knew how to sew. Learned that when I was a little kid from my mom and dad. So I put my device in my jacket, and I put the switch on the zipper. You see it there? So these two little pads are conductive thread. So when the metal zipper goes by the conductive thread, it closes the switch and it activates the device. So then all I had to do when I go into a restaurant is unzip my jacket and take it off and then the TVs are down and nobody knew. It was awesome. Like it worked great. But like you think you could buy something like this in a store? It's such a, a small audience for the project. Such a small group of people find this useful that it's not a viable commercial product. The TV Be Gone kit is a viable commercial product, but this is better delivered as a tutorial, a way for you to build it at home, because it was really easy, and all you needed was a little sewing. So there's a diagram, and I published a tutorial, and I made a video, and it became clear, I, I didn't think this about myself then, that I was uniquely good at the intersection of crafts and technology. So based on my publishing lots and lots of projects, when I looked at them as a whole, I saw a trend. And even though I find that um, I'm, a, I'm a misfit, and I feel like misfits sometimes can't dream big because they can't imagine a world that serves them. Instead of dreaming for the star over there and going towards it, I felt like I was on a train and I'm just putting down the tracks like right in front of me as I go hoping that I'll go somewhere meaningful. So that happened here, where I would look back on my projects and say, oh, I see, I could do more projects at the intersection of crafts and technology. This, this GIF sums up how happy I was to work at Make Magazine. It was a very fun job. And then from there, but, <laughs> but Make Magazine is funded by advertisers. And so eventually, um, I became bored of the type of work that we were doing. I wasn't bored of documenting. I wasn't bored of electronics. I was bored of dealing with salespeople. So I went to work at a company called Adafruit. Do you guys know about Adafruit? That's probably why most of you know who I am, right? Where I was documenting techniques and projects at the intersection of crafts or fashion and technology. And I was teaching people online how to build skirts that light up when you dance and ties that light up when you talk. Again, projects with a limited audience, if you were thinking about it as a commercial product, 
but with a wide audience when, when it's about learning the techniques that then you could use for your own creative projects. And I love inspiring other creative people way more than I like selling things, way more. I also made a plush game controller that uses conductive fabric and an Arduino microcontroller to uh, play games. It works like a USB keyboard, but it's no soldering required, just a little, very little sewing even. And when, and when you're not using it, you can unplug it and put it on the couch. And these light up shoes, very fun. So I was really enjoying, I, I, I had a career all of a sudden. My job was inspiring people online to learn new things and to make cool costumes that help them express themselves. And that felt awesome. And along the way, I learned that the thing that made it so awesome was the documentation. It's no good to have inspiration and then not have the information to be able to learn it or the pathway for discovery. And so writing down the mistakes I thought people might make or giving them links to places to buy all of the materials, taking nothing for granted and writing tutorials that explain step by step how to put together these rather bizarre projects, but hopefully you learn something along the way. And so if I'm an expert at anything, it's at project documentation. Because to be honest, I'm a little bored of wearable electronics right now. It'll come back. But I'm not bored about cameras or documenting things. And this is the thing, the thread that's gone through my life is that if I'm able to document what I'm working on, I get more satisfaction out of it. So I have some tips for you. Oh, and yeah, and quickly, this is a scene from one of our shoots. Our shoots became quickly more elaborate. And before I knew it, I had 140 tutorials on how to put together these bizarre projects. But I have some tips for you if you want to document your projects, OK? Number one, your light is more important than your camera. All of you have smartphones, most of you. When I, was, when I started, this was my first camera, and my phone was not a good enough camera to shoot anything. Now, your phone is a great camera. And if you can find your light, you will take great photos with whatever camera you have. This camera lasted a long time. Love that camera. So that's my second point. The, the best camera is the one you have with you. Uh, too much documentation, too, taking too many photos or too much video is better than not enough. If you can set up a camera above your workstation and leave it there with the video rolling the entire time, you're like, what am I going to do with this footage? There's too much. Yeah, speed it up, make a time lapse. You'd be more happy having it than wishing you had it later. Then I would say, write a script about your project. Pretend you're making a movie, even if you don't make a video about your project. Pretend you're making one and write a script that's you explaining your project to your friend who's really interested. That's the best way to relate to people online is to explain to them as though they are your friend who's interested. And then create a destination for your project, whether it's uh, you make an account on Instructables, or you publish it on your blog, or you publish your project on like Hackster.io, or any of these publishing platforms. Find a destination for your project and put all of the details there, all of the pictures, all of the video all of the products you use, the tools, the materials. And then ask for the type of feedback you want. If you struggled with something, write about it. If you want to learn more about something, write about it. Because then those people who are interested will be invited to engage with you, and you might make some new friends. Through publishing online, I have made at least three very notable friends who I met through internet comments who became very good friends of mine in real life and coworkers even. So those are my tips, okay? Light, any camera, too much is better, write a script, 
create a destination. But you might be saying, my projects are crap. I don't like my, nobody wants to see my projects. What is that voice in your head that says that to you? That voice isn't very nice. You shouldn't listen to him or her. Self-doubt plagues us all. I've got it like right now. <laughs> but you should interpret your self-doubt instead of saying, what if I can't do it? Say, what if I can do it? And then try. Because what are you afraid of? Are people going to laugh at you? Are they going to lose respect for you because you pop? Like, no. And remember, people are very self-absorbed. They're nobody's judging you as harshly as you're judging yourself. And this is really clear when I teach. I teach a class at an art school in New York called School of the Visual Arts. And these are my students. So when I took that class in college and made that plush nightlight, it really had an impact on me. So I have my students do the same project. It involves LEDs, it involves sewing. Many of them had never touched either of those things before they started this project, and they all had a lot of self-doubt. Some of them were even embarrassed to show their attempts to do the project. But that's because the picture of it in their head didn't match the, what turned out from making it with their hands. There's a mismatch. But wouldn't you all agree that the first drafts of everything don't come out so great and you need to refine? But when you're the one creating it, it's easy to lose sight of that. So I pushed them the same way my teachers pushed me to push through the self-doubt and reinterpret it as enthusiastic skepticism. What if I can? It's this mindset that there's like room for improvement. I told you that I got inspired by photography because I could see that I had a lot to learn. That feedback's not me, right? And so if you can, if you can cultivate this mindset that, there's, uh, that you always can improve, it's a critical to growing, critical to growth in any field you pursue. Taking risks is uncomfortable but you're, you can't grow unless you're uncomfortable. Speaking of which, I want you to regret your actions, not your inactions. This photo makes me uncomfortable because it's, it's a compilation of like many videos I made over many years, and I have made some questionable decisions regarding my hair and my eyebrows. But guess what? I would rather regret making something than regret not making something. This one is really important. So you're on this creative path. You kind of know where you're going or you don't. But think about a best-selling author. You, like the, I, I watched a TED talk by the woman who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which is a very popular novel. And she was talking about being scared of what her next book would be about or how it would be received because you can't top a bestseller like that. It's going to be bad no matter what. Well, what happens, like how would she feel four books later? If you can just put it behind you and keep making, you habituate yourself to a routine that invites self-reflection. So if you say, I'm gonna post on my blog once a week about whatever I'm excited about, in four years, you'll have so much stuff that you can reflect on and learn more about yourself and what you like to do. Because the more ideas you have, the more good ideas you'll find in the sea of ideas. But if you get creative and you have a big success or a big failure, it could really knock you down. And I think that the only way to get over that is to keep producing. I'll tell you a story. I made this necklace. It's like an ASCII heart, right? You send it in a text message. And it's made out of silver. And I, I, with my hands and a saw, I cut out the shape and I soldered on the tubing. And I assembled it and I took, I took a video and I took photos and I, I put it on my Etsy shop. And it became popular. 
lots of people wanted to buy my necklace. I was so excited. And every time I'd make one, I'd think, oh, this, ne this necklace is going to Susie in Ohio. This necklace is going to be a Valentine's Day gift for this nerdy guy's girlfriend. And I felt really happy about enabling that expression. But eventually it became popular enough that I didn't have time to make them all. And so I had to partially mechanize the process. So I would, I would order silver and I would take it to this laser cutting place and they would cut the shapes. And then I would go and pick it up and bring it to a jeweler and the jeweler would solder the silver together and polish it. Then I would pick it up and I would do the final assembly, put it in a box and then sell it on Etsy. And after a couple years, the hot season is like Christmas and Valentine's Day. I, realized, I enjoyed making the necklaces, but the necklaces weren't inspiring other people to be creative, and I, I wasn't getting that, like, that same satisfaction. And because it was marketed as a handmade product, I didn't feel like I could completely automate or turn over the production to, I didn't want to be in the jewelry business either. And I didn't feel like I wanted to turn over production to someone else. So I discontinued the, the product. I stopped selling them. I mean, also emojis came out and like, this is like old, you know, this is it was outdated by then too. Only old fogies are interested. So this is me surviving my own success, right? The project was successful and so it seems like, oh, it's such a shame that you can't get that necklace. No, it's a shame if I waste my time on something that's not bringing me joy. Also, limited edition. I also failed at drones. Who, do you guys like drones? Yeah. I thought I liked drones. I, didn't, I did a deep dive, and I, it turns out that I don't really like drones. But um, just as I get scared, it's really scary to me. Um, but I want to show you a little video that doesn't have any talking, so you should be able to understand the meaning um, without being able to like hear, because it's loud in here, about a drone project I did that didn't come out so great. But I published the video anyway. This project never worked, right? We never got it to work. The load is really heavy. The spray can like propels against the, it's just, it's just a, I mean, it's, it's not a great idea. 
But it was really fun, and, and this idea captivates a lot of imaginations. And we did publish what we did learn. We published the custom settings for the drone that help it fly better with the can attached to it. We published our work so far in the hopes that other people would learn from it and be able to build on our work. And if I had been, if I had been a perfectionist, I never would have published this project at all because it's a complete failure. But it was really fun to work on it. So you gotta be careful about being a perfectionist because it can, it can keep you from finding yourself. Publish early and often. And direct the feedback you want. I published this project and I wrote all of the problems, right? Couldn't get this to work, really struggled with this. And that way you get people writing in saying, oh, what if you try? And it might even reinvigorate the inspiration to work on it more. Or you might find new collaborators who could add something and make it get off the ground. Pun almost not intended. So I read this great quote, give voice to the story only you know how to tell, because it could be the whole point of your life. And right now what I'm passionate about working on and documenting online is my journey in repairing my vintage motorcycle. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I preguntas. Hello, uh, Becky. I I wanted to tell you that I'm your biggest fan. Uh, I have watched your videos for years, and also I have been able to make some of your projects. Uh, for example, I think the last one was the, the pendant. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, I just uh, I just wanted to ask you. Uh, I, I saw that you are not working for Adafruit anymore. Uh, so, well, you you mentioned that you were bored or something, but I would like to know. Uh, the reasons that you left that company and what exactly are you doing today? That's a good question. I meant, I meant to address it, but I forgot. So in February, and if you see in the program, the program has my Adafruit bio. Until recently, I was the director of wearable electronics at Adafruit. The reason I left is because I needed to pursue more broad topics. I needed to just take a break from electronics for a while. And I, I also had felt like um, when, when you, you learn a lot at jobs, right? And um, when you're done learning, you're done growing. And uh, I feel like I learned, I was, re I was just ready to move on to, to and right, okay, so right now I am a content creator at Instructables. Instructables is a website where you can publish your own projects. And that's where I work now. And so now I do the same thing. My job is exactly the same. Publish cool projects online, but now they are not exact solely wearable electronics. They can be wearable electronics and motorcycles and whatever comes next, right? That's all. It's a great place. Well, hi, Becky. Um, I feel very identified with your story when you told about uh, when you can't find your your passion because well I'm studying publishing publishing yeah and I thought I thought that maybe well I like the design or photography but when I do the things I say oh god I'm bored so what what is next so how do you find your passion, your real passion, when you have a lot of, of things in your mind? That's a great question. You have to be open-minded as to where your next passion could come from, right? And oftentimes your passion starts out as a hobby or, or an interest or something your friend's showing you. And um, I don't know exactly how to fully answer your question because I because obviously I've been interested in a lot of things and I think you're drawn to a specific 
area. Like for embroidery, for me, it was like, oh, I know that I like other crafts that involve needles and thread, but I've never tried this one before. Maybe it will be fun. So if you look at the things you know you like doing, and you can pull out what about them you like doing, like I like stitching. Let me look for other activities that involve that thing I like, and then try them for a little bit. It's, again. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to find things that you're passionate about. Not by watching TV, that's for sure. Algunas preguntas más. Bueno. Uh, hi Becky, I didn't know you till this conference uh, and I'm a little embarrassed about it but I had a lot of fun uh, hearing you talking about this and uh, my question is this uh, you said something important that sometimes the, um, your passion is not for everybody um, it's like for a little group Limited of people audience, yeah. yeah, yeah something very concentrated I mean uh, for example what you do wearable electronic wearables it's not something that anybody wants to buy wants to wear uh, uh, my question is this do you think that the um, a specific audience is the future I mean like the groups the communities when you can be successful and uh, economic uh, and uh, by your passion do you think that that's something that we need to look for no so I don't think that you need to have a career in your passion area in order to live your passion there's a really interesting talk um, it's that guy's name Mike Rowe who has a TV show called dirty jobs where he interviews people who like clean sewage tanks and like do a lot of really hard manual labor jobs that seem like they, they don't have a lot of creativity to them. But there's a, really, there's a satisfaction in being good at what you do. And if you can translate that into economic success by running a business, or by the way, like running a business means you're a business person and you get removed from like the actual creating. And that's why I've never started my own business except for an Etsy shop because I don't want to be a business person, I want to be a creative person who just creates all the time. So if you, if you find that your public, the thing is publishing your passions online can get you a job you never imagined. I didn't know there was such a thing as like a paid blogger for Make Magazine until I got an email offering me the job. I have, I, I have applied for one job in my life when I was 16 years old. After that, every job opportunity I had was offered to me whether it was I was a camp counselor and then I wanted to be a counselor, they were like, you belong here, do you want a job? I published my projects and they, so I'm, I guess I'm saying that you don't have to, if you seek it out, your passion as a monetary or economic, like as a job to start, it can go poorly. But if you publish rigorously online, because it's what you love to do, you will find opportunities to get paid for what you love to do, even if it's on the side of your regular job. And that creates your whole person because you're not just a designer or an engineer, maybe you're also a motorcycle mechanic. Una más. Hello, Becky. Uh, I've been in electronics for a while. I, I know all your work. I know, uh, you know all, the, all the things that Instructionables are doing right now for all the communities around the world. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, what it's? Uh, how do you think that your work is actually, you know, affecting all the teachers in the universities in the U.S. and also outside the U.S.? Because I think that your work is, you know, opening a lot of, uh, I don't know, minds or whatever. And actually, you're you're doing, you know, teacher jobs a little bit more easy, right? Because you're showing, you're publishing everything. So, how do you feel and what do you think about how your work can just enhance all these, you know, uh, studying culture? Your question is actually a statement worded as a question because I'm just going to repeat what you said. <laughs> and that is that I create materials that then teachers can use in their classrooms. Um, you guys have all heard this phrase, stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So if I can make a tutorial and you can make, access it freely on the internet, that means that any teacher with internet can use that material to teach their students. And 
uh, only uh, that's not my main like I don't know that that's my main goal but it's to it's to inspire and educate so teachers are a great place for that um, I hear anecdotally like from my experience teachers telling me I use your work in my classroom curriculum and I don't know the material so having your work there as a reference makes me the enabler and I don't have to be an expert to teach that stuff and so I think that's really cool, is to democratize tools by publishing what you know, because then someone else can stand on top of what you know to teach someone else. And maybe teaching is their specialty, but electronics is not, right? So I reworded your question as a statement. Gracias por todo. Um, we're gonna go have a meetup in the makerspace, yeah? Somebody nod to me over there, right after this, if you wanna come and hang out more and chat and take pictures and stuff. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here.